Hello sugar glider enthusiasts. My name is Dr. Claire Hollily. I'm from the University of Canberra and the Institute for Applied Ecology and I'm going to be talking today about the research I'm conducting on sugar glider genetics. My talk today will be in three sections. The first of which is the success story of the 2013 crowdfunding campaign that has kick-started my research on sugar gliders. This will cover how the campaign proceeded, the groundswell of support from the community, and how the media has really taken an interest in the genetics of sugar gliders. The next part of my talk will be about phase one of the sugar glider genetics project. And this is about the origin story of gliders in the USA. Here I will talk about the aims of phase one and the background for this part of the study. I will then share with you some exciting preliminary results that start to give us an idea where sugar gliders in the USA have come from. Lastly, I'll talk about what work needs to be done to finalise phase one of the sugar glider genetics project and how the community can help with this. In the third and final part of my talk, I'm going to talk about phase two of the sugar glider genetics project. And this is about the discovery of coat colour genes in sugar gliders. I will explain how we're going to use next generation sequencing technology and new analysis methods to find coat colour genes. So how did I kickstart my research on sugar gliders? I used a concept called crowdfunding. For those of you not familiar, crowdfunding is the act of many people contributing money to a project or a common goal that they believe in. It is a form of sponsorship that usually leverages social media to reach a wide audience and attract a large number of small contributions. This is a common fundraising approach for charitable causes, but it has not been used much for scientific projects. For example, in 2012, only 3.2% of worldwide crowdfunding revenue was for science and technology-based projects. This crowdfunding approach was hugely successful. I was overwhelmed by the community support for my project. Not only did we reach our funding target, we actually exceeded it. Sugar Glider Lovers literally gave 110% towards this project. We raised $9,000, or just slightly over, from 75 different people contributing. So how did it all happen? I launched the campaign this time last year at the OSGA conference in 2013. This graph shows the ups and downs of what happened in the campaign. The blue line shows the traffic on my video, so it indicates how much interest is being generated about the project. The red line indicates the number of donations and the dollars that have been contributed during the campaign. You can immediately see that most of the interest and indeed most of the initial funding has been spurred due to the OSGA conference and related forum activity. I then used my science communication skills to try and harness the power of social networking to generate interest in the project. Particularly successful was a post by the Facebook group Science Alert. This group had 3.8 million subscribers at the time and it now has over 5.2 million. So we had the potential to reach a huge audience. In just 12 hours after my post, the project got more than 5,000 likes and was shared by other people more than a thousand times. As you would expect, this exposure caused a huge spike in our traffic blue line on the graph but the effect on our funding line didn't happen till a bit later, and I'll explain why. A crowdfunding campaign is like having a conversation with your audience. You need to convince them that they care about your research. So one single Facebook post is probably not going to be enough to convince people to contribute money. This is why I then started to use this exposure on the Facebook site to grab the media attention of other sources I made a personal appearance on ABC Breakfast Radio and talked about the Sugar Glider Genetics Project. I also made sure that the project was featured by over 12 print and online media articles and we even got one front page article. 
The project was also featured by crowdfunding blogs, which all helped to generate a media buzz. So with the combination of social media, radio, print and online media, and internet blogs, you can start to see now that our red funding line is starting to push towards our goal. The most important time of a crowdfunding campaign is the very end, and so for the final push, I managed to enlist help from the Institute for Applied Ecology's professional science communicator, and she helped develop some great images to help push us over the line towards our funding goal. So you can see on our roller coaster graph that there is a huge last minute effect. Most of the donations came in within the last 24 hours, and in fact a lot of them within the last 30 minutes. I wanted now to take the time to specifically thank all of the people who have made contributions to this campaign, all 75 people. Whether your contribution was big or small, all of it has contributed to a successful campaign and reaching the funding goal for this project. I would like to specifically thank the major donors that made contributions of $1,000 or more, the first of which was Exotic Nutrition Pet Company in the USA, and their website is listed here. The second major donor was Glider Boy Gliders, and their website is also listed. As well as making generous financial contributions, two people have provided enormous help with the logistical side of this project. Thanks to Shelley Stirk for inviting me to present at OSGA 2013 and inspiring this crowdfunding campaign. I appreciate your help with promoting and organising the US side of this project. Thanks also to Kaylee Slickis for her donations and assistance with sample collection, DNA extraction and for persevering with the horrendous paperwork when shipping samples. I'm extremely excited that we have reached our funding target and I'm really amazed also at the added benefits that I have received from this crowdfunding campaign. The media attention surrounding this campaign has really raised awareness about my research and has allowed me to attract new collaborators, grow my research team by attracting students. I've also discovered new research questions that might be interesting for the future and it's helped me to attract new samples from areas where I didn't have before. Now that you know what happened during the crowdfunding campaign, I can talk to you about some of the preliminary results from the Sugar Glider Genetics Project, in particular Phase 1 about the origin story of gliders in the USA. Sugar gliders are a species that are native to Australia, as well as New Guinea and the surrounding islands. Despite there being a very large population of sugar gliders kept domestically as pets within the USA, nobody really knows where they have come from. Have they come from Australia or have they come from New Guinea? Anecdotal reports suggest that Western Papua is most likely the true origin of US sugar gliders. However, there are anecdotal reports by some people based on fur coloration patterns suggesting that there could be other sources as well. Because sugar gliders in their native range are not endangered, the movement of these animals is not tracked by CITES. Similarly, because sugar gliders are of course not a food item or an agricultural species, the USDA does not keep track of their movements either. To solve this mystery, I have collected samples from across the USA, sequenced three of their genes, and compared the variation in the US glider population to what we observe in its native range. So far, I have sequenced a total of 146 animals, but as you can see from the map, the sampling is pretty biased. Almost all of the samples come from Texas, with just 19 smattered across the rest of the USA. The strength of my conclusions will be directly proportional to how good the sampling effort is. So for us to draw conclusions about the whole population, we really need to have a representative sample from a broader area. So if you are a sugar glider owner pretty much living anywhere other than Texas, then I would be interested in receiving samples from your gliders. 
But still, sequencing from 146 animals is still pretty good and it is certainly enough data for us to start to have a look and address that question about the origin of sugar gliders in the USA. This picture here shows a phylogenetic tree of sugar gliders both from the USA and from the native range in Australia and New Guinea. Now, I know that the font is a little bit small here, so I don't want you to try and read any of the, the little names there. What you need to do is just focus on the colors that are indicated and highlighted on the right. All of the animals in orange are from the USA. These are the 146 animals that we've sequenced, mostly from Texas, but a few other places. The other colors are from the native range, Papua New Guinea, the Northern Territory, different states within Australia, and these can correspond to the different variation in the native range and the different subspecies of sugar glider. The first thing that we notice about this phylogenetic tree is that sugar gliders from the USA have their own genetic signature. All of the orange animals have been clumped together and they're not interspersed with the other colours. So they have their own signal, which is great because it means we can identify them clearly. The next thing that we can tell from this tree is that the US gliders in orange are most closely related to the next branch on the tree, which is the light green one, the New Guinea gliders. In particular, the most closely related to the US population is a sample that has come from an island off the coast of Western Papua. So based on our first 146 samples, here is the most likely source of the US population. This is almost certainly the origin for these gliders, a little island off the coast of Western Papua. But we have to remember that this all depends on our samples. So just because these 146 animals come from this area, it doesn't mean that all of the animals within the US are all from the same place. All of the samples that have been contributed so far have been opportunistic samples where people who have been getting their gliders desexed have actually sent me the tissue that would normally be thrown away from that surgical procedure and I have used this to extract DNA from. Whilst this tissue is a really awesome source of DNA, it's a little bit limited because not everybody gets their sugar gliders desexed, and in particular, the really interesting animals with interesting colour morphs are often not desexed because they want to be used uh, in breeding programs. To solve this problem, I'm developing a new technique that tries to get DNA from mouth swabs of sugar gliders. This is a technique that's really commonly used in human genetics where you use a little swab that wipes the inside of your cheek to collect the DNA sample and then you wipe it onto this specially treated piece of cardboard called an FTA card. This FTA card is specially designed to bind the DNA and store it safely. And then you can ship it anywhere you want, even Australia. As you would imagine, the amount of DNA that you can get from a mouth swab is much, much lower than a piece of tissue or perhaps some blood. So I'm going to have to optimise this procedure. One of the things I'm going to experiment with is actually dipping the swab in sugary substances to try and encourage the sugar gliders to perhaps mouth the, uh, the mouth swab a little bit more and then we might get a better DNA sample from it. Uh, but we're going to have to definitely optimise this before putting it into practice to make sure that any substance that we put on the swab doesn't interfere with the DNA extraction and the DNA sequencing. Whilst this procedure isn't completely optimised just yet, I'm hoping that at the conference today that there will be a sign-up sheet available if you're interested in having your gliders mouth swabs when the test becomes available. So before moving on to a discussion of coat colour gene discovery in sugar gliders, I'd just like to highlight some recent research that's coming out of another research group from Charles Darwin University that's some taxonomic work on sugar gliders within the, the native range in Australia and specifically the Northern Territory. This work has brought into question the identity of a group of mammals in the Northern Territory that were previously thought to be a subspecies of the sugar glider, 
but it turns out they may not be sugar gliders at all. They might be their own species and they're more closely related to the squirrel glider or the mahogany glider. So this new taxonomic discovery is really interesting from my perspective because there has been some reports that um, gliders from the Northern Territory might actually have been transported from the Northern Territory to New Guinea and then to the US. So I'm kind of wondering whether or not there's a possibility that sugar gliders in the US might not even be sugar gliders at all. I'm currently working with the team who has made this taxonomic discovery to include some of these samples of the newly described species in my ongoing research. Now I'm going to move on to the, the third and final part of my talk which discusses uh, coat colour gene discovery in sugar gliders and this makes up the, the phase two, the second part of the sugar glider genetics project. So when we commence searching for coat coloration genes, it's really important in the first instance to choose really the, the right coat color to begin with. We want to develop our protocol uh, on a, a really easy phenotype to define. Uh, it needs to be a clear presence, presence or absence and no, no confusion about this fur color. Can't be a judgment call. So anything that's describing different shades of colors in fur is not going to be a good place to start. And the fur color um, mutation has really got to be constant throughout the life of the glider. It can't be something that, that changes. It's got to be constant throughout the whole life. Ideally, um, it'll be a coat color morph that has got some data about family history. So how the how the coat color is inherited through through pedigrees of animals. So the first port of call for uh, coat color gene discovery is most likely going to be what I'm describing as the white mutations. So the true albinos, where there's there's no pigment in the fur and indeed no pigment in the eye. So you've got the the red red eye in the the white true albino, and also in the the leukistic. Um, animals. So they also have no pigment, they're white mutations, but have black eyes instead of the red eyes. So these are likely to be two completely different mutations. Uh, they're going to have different pedigrees and different inheritance, so they'll be treated you know, separately. But they're a good, good phenotype. It's easy to define and there's a lot of information in the breeding community about how, how these mutations have been inherited in pedigrees. So in the old days, before the, the advent of new high throughput sequencing technologies, um, the approach that you might have used to find, um, find coat colour genes in animals is what we would call a candidate gene approach. So basically what this does is, is look at sort of a list of usual suspect genes that, that are likely and known to be involved in this type of mutation. So you're using previous research to really guide your investigation and sort of pick out the genes that you think are, are likely going to be involved. So there are certain advantages to taking a, a candidate gene approach and one of them is that, you know, if you're only looking at these specific genes that you, you have a good inkling are involved in this mutation. Uh, it means you may not have to actually investigate lots and lots of genomic regions if you hone right down on something that you think is functionally involved. However, using this low throughput sequencing, sort of old tech sequencing technology, can be actually quite expensive um, to do this, especially if your, your search is going to be reasonably big. So instead of going on what could be described as a, a bit of a fishing expedition like our guy here on the bottom of the screen, uh, and making a lot of assumptions about the, the genetic basis of coat colour mutations, we're going to use a different approach that utilises new high throughput sequencing technology to um, discover coat colour mutations without making any, um, any assumptions. So the new approach that I'm talking about is called whole genome subtraction. So this is pretty much a completely different way of going about things where you're actually sequencing the whole genome of individuals and comparing them to see what's different between, between different animals. The whole genome subtraction approach has some advantages. 
So this is what's called de novo discovery. So we aren't limited to what we already know about. We're taking a fresh look at the genome and seeing what's there. And we're not making our, our research susceptible to any biases that have been in previous research. By using the most current sequencing technologies, the high throughput sequencing approach is actually way more cost effective on a per gene basis. And the other benefit is that the data can have multiple uses. So once we're finished looking at gene discovery for, for coat color mutations, we can actually use the same data for other purposes, such as a whole genome assembly of the sugar glider genome. As we all know in this life, nothing is a, nothing is a silver bullet. So there are downsides to this approach as well. So one of the issues that are commonly faced is that whole genome sequencing of this type generates lots and lots and lots of data. So getting a really well honed data analysis method is extremely important to be able to deal with this uh, quantity of data. So this also means that basically you have the answer in your data, but the trickiest part is actually finding it. So instead of going on a, a fishing expedition like our previous slide with the candidate gene approach, now we have the situation where we're really trying to find a, a needle in a haystack. And um, the trick is if you can develop your methods well enough, you can make that needle in the haystack big enough that you can pull it out easily. Luckily, the research team at the University of Canberra and the Institute for Applied Ecology has already spent quite a lot of time developing whole genome subtraction analysis. And I've done this work in collaboration with Arthur Georges, who most of the time works on lizards and turtles. But as you can see in this photograph here, he's got a little bit of a sweet spot for sugar gliders as well. And he's been instrumental in developing this whole genome subtraction method which we've originally designed for looking at the differences between males and females, uh, but can equally be used to look at the differences between a white glider and a gray glider. The whole genome subtraction analysis method is pretty complicated when you go into the details and it involves splitting the genome up into millions and millions of different pieces, comparing them, finding the differences, and then trying to put that million, million piece puzzle back together again. So I'm not going to go into all technical details of the whole genome subtraction today, but what I am going to do is explain the concepts underlying the analysis method and explain how it can be really powerful for detecting differences, but how it's also got a few limitations that you really need to, to consider when you're interpreting your data. So the premise underlying a whole genome subtraction is actually a a very simple and very intuitive one when you've got two animals that have a difference between them. So in this case, an albino white glider on the left and a normal gray glider on the right, you can compare them bioinformatically and look for the differences. So these gray shapes down the bottom of the slide represent sugar glider chromosomes. And on the white glider, we've got a mutation indicated by an orange line. So if you're a white glider, you've got two copies of this orange mutation. And if you're a normal gray glider, you don't have any. And so basically what we want to do is compare the two and identify the difference. In this simplified example, our genome subtraction has easily pulled out that orange mutation as the difference between these two animals. But the difficulties start to creep in with this method when we realise that there are lots and lots of differences between different animals that are nothing to do with their coat colour mutation. And, you know, we all have a, a sense of this in our day-to-day our -day lives. The person sitting next to you, you know, might have different eye colour, they might be a different height, they might have a different shade of skin. There could be all kinds of differences in the genome that have nothing to do with your um, area of interest, which in this case is, is the white mutation. In our stylized representation of sugar glider chromosomes on the slide here, all of these differences between individuals are represented by the black bars. So they're differences just like the, the orange bar, but they don't have to do with our trait of interest. And so the whole genome subtraction is really powerful and it will pick up every single difference between the two animals that you're comparing 
whether or not you care about it or not. So what this means is at the end of the subtraction you could be left with a whole bunch of candidates that could be the area of the genome that's responsible for a white mutation but it could be hidden by all of this other variation that you've also detected, just the differences between individuals. So the best way to compensate for this um, problem that can crop up in a, a genome subtraction is to choose your animals for sequencing really carefully and the best way is to actually sequence and compare family groups. So again, everyone will have um, kind of an intuitive sense of, of the genetic differences between individuals. Most people will know that you've got a much um, greater chance of looking similar to your brother or your sister or your mother or your father than just some random person that you happen to meet on the street. And this is reflected also in your genome. So you will share many more genetic variants with your family than with a random person. So for the genome subtraction, if we reduce the variation in the animals that we're comparing by sequencing related animals, then this is going to greatly increase our chance of success. Moving forward with phase two of the Sugar Glider Genetics Project means I'll be looking for contributions from the public who own whole families of sugar gliders and are happy to contribute samples from related animals, some with the white coat colour and some with the grey colour. Specifically, what I'll be looking for is parent offspring comparisons or sibling to sibling comparisons. So if you have gliders that meet these uh, very specific requirements, I would definitely be interested in having you put your details on the sign up sheet that will be available at the conference. However, before volunteering, um, people need to be aware that for the coat colour discovery aspect we need really high quality and a high quantity of DNA for this sequencing technology. So we're not going to be able to use the non-invasive sampling technique. There will need to be blood or tissue samples taken from these animals and often the coat colour and uh, coat colour mutations can be quite prized animals. Uh, so you may not be comfortable with this aspect of the study. Once we've done the genome subtraction and discovered the genes responsible for coat colour variation in sugar gliders, I'm hoping that this research will be really useful to sugar glider breeders. The first thing that you'll be able to do is identify animals in your breeding population that are heterozygote for genes uh, and coat colours of interest which will mean that you can more accurately plan the breeding between individuals if you're aiming for specific colours. And it also could provide a mechanism for actual quality assurance uh, during sales. So if you're purchasing a um, grey sugar glider on the assumption that it is a heterozygote animal, you will hopefully have a way of actually confirming that this is true prior to purchase. So to summarise how you can help as a member of the public uh, to get this research done is first of all to contribute samples. There will be a sign-up sheet available both for the non-invasive mouth swab kits uh, that I will send out once I have optimised the method and there will also be a sign-up sheet for people owning sugar glider families that have different coat colour mutations. The other way that you can help is, of course, by providing research funding. Whilst the Rocket Hub crowdfunding campaign is officially over now and has been successful, I am, of course, accepting any donations that might be made available. And this is done now through uh, the link below, sugargliders.hollily.net slash donate. This will redirect you to a secure payment portal through the University of Canberra where you can enter your details. And this concludes my talk for today about the Sugar Glider Genetics Project and I hope that you have found it interesting and thank you very much for listening about my research.